Welcome to the inaugural episode of The Ithacast. I'm Duxon Nguyen. I'm Seth Murta. Seth, why are we doing this? Well, we thought it would be a good idea to broadcast the conversations that we have on a regular basis as representatives on Common Council. Um, we're always talking to people. We're talking to residents. We're talking to city staff, other elected officials. And in the interest of transparency, we thought it'd be a cool idea to do a podcast just to so that people could listen in on the conversations that we have on an everyday basis. Absolutely. And plus, we're always looking for new ways to connect with our constituents. It's notoriously hard to get people engaged. This is one way using the increasingly popular podcast format to get some some real discussion between two elected officials. So we're here today with Savante Mark, mayor of the city of Ithaca. Hey, hey. Hello, Savante. Hey, how's it going? We're here in our studio, yeah. otherwise known <laughs> as Duxon's Dining Room. It's a lovely studio. Yes. And as you said, it, it occurred to me that should be the name of the podcast, Between Two Elected Officials. It's like Between Two Firms, <laughs> except here I am sitting... Uh, sandwich like crossfire style between two elected officials but it's that's three it. elected officials because well, you are well that's true but the third is between the other you know what? i'll workshop this <laughs> i will uh i'll go back to the drawing board and see if i can think of a better name so we thought we'd invite you on to talk about housing uh because that is the big issue today that everybody yes. is talking about in the city i yes. know uh, it's always a perennial issue yeah um i've done the crummy apartment tour in this city <laughs> I, I know you have as well yes i might uh, set the record for Living in the most crummy apartments in the shortest amount of time. I think at this point you may have lived in every single apartment in the city. Of <laughs> Close to it. I've at least crashed on the couches of, I'm now a second ward resident. I've lived in the fifth, the fourth. I've never lived in the first or the third. Hmm. So I haven't made it to every ward, but... Uh, there's still I, time. There's still... <laughs> <laughs> And it's most, it's true. And it, and the moving around is necessitated by the fact that I used to, as you guys remember, have eight roommates. That's and, right. And then, you've, you know, you've come up a bit since the hollow justice days. <laughs> I have to say, as we call it hollow justice. Yes. It's a big issue. And I'm glad to talk about it with you guys today. What are we doing? Like, what is our housing strategy for, for the city of Ithaca? I mean, if you could just yeah. summarize it. Yeah, I think it's threefold. Uh, we got to lower taxes. You got to increase the amount of housing that's available and we have to subsidize housing, right? That's a three pronged strategy. Why does that strategy make sense? Well, you got to first figure out why is the housing expensive, right? I mean, unless you know why the costs are so high, you can never come up with a strategy that'll actually bring them down. So a lot of people have theories about why it's expensive. First, landlords are greedy. Well, Maybe. Yeah. I mean, sure. Yeah. Like people are greedy. Landlords are people. So I'm sure landlords are greedy too. But that doesn't explain it alone, right? Because movie theater owners are greedy and barbershop owners are greedy and uh, janitors are greedy and mayors are greedy. So that theory that like landlords are just greedy and keep increasing the, the rent doesn't make sense. Uh, the, the second is folks like to blame it on the students. This is getting a little bit closer to the truth, right? The fact that we have so many students does drive up the cost of rent here because in part their source of income is not tied to economic realities of Tompkins County, right? It's either right. coming from their parents, some of whom are poor, but many of whom are very wealthy and, and who living in Manhattan, their rents are much higher than here in Ithaca. So the rents seem reasonable so they can just afford it. But it's not just students, and it's not just that landlords are greedy. There's a one simple fact that's driving us, and that's that more people want to live here mm -hmm. than we have houses. Right. As long as you have more people want to live here than you have houses, the price will go up and up and up. It's sort of econ 101. You can look at the inverse. What happens in cities where you have 40,000 houses and only 20,000 people want to live there, mm -hmm. right? which is the case in Binghamton, for example, which is you know, one third of the population it did 40 years ago. What's the price of housing in Binghamton? It's very inexpensive. Mm -hmm. I'd right. say that's true of most of upstate New York um, yeah. outside of the, the major metro areas. That's right. I mean, yeah. even even outside of the city of Ithaca, and you go out in Newfin you know, Newfield or, or I thought Brown. you were about to say Newfoundland. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the housing prices are like in Newfoundland. But right. And and so and and you look at Detroit, even though that's now seeing a resurgence like like most American cities are seeing resurgence right now. When you have a bunch of empty houses, the prices are low. 
When you have no empty houses, the prices are high. That's what we have right now. We have tenants who have no bargaining power. So that's why a big prong of this, and it's a controversial part of our housing strategy, is you have to add more housing. A lot of people wish this weren't true. I, I know that you've encountered, that both of you have encountered this. A lot of people want there to be a way to solve the housing crisis without adding more housing units. And I just don't think it's possible. I mean, I don't think it can. It doesn't make any sense. It defies economics as we know it. And also, even if we could, it denies people, in my opinion, access to the benefits of urban living that include not just quality of life for the people who live here, but the sustainability of their lifestyles mm -hmm. you know, overall. It it does seem, though, that, I mean, of the housing, because we are adding housing. I mean, right. there's no question. I mean, we've seen housing development in College Town. We've seen housing development downtown. I mean, a lot of the housing that we're adding, though, seems to be in the, the higher end right. of the market. Um, and I got to say, like, a lot of people say this is luxury housing. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think actual luxury housing exists in it. Like, when yeah. I think of luxury <laughs> housing, like, you know, you have a, a doorman who's, like, trying right. to figure out if the the right person is getting in the building. Like, yeah. that doesn't exist in, in, in Ithaca. But the, the housing that is being built, I'd say, is more for, it's like, well-heeled It's professionals. luxury prices. It's luxury prices. It's luxury prices. Yeah. Right. And I and you look at – and a lot of it built with the tax abatement policy. Right. Um, and you see, like, a lot of the, the new development around the commons. Yep. Um, it's – it's housing that I'd say is for people in in the range of seventy thousand to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. But what's mm -hmm. not being built is housing in the range of you know twenty thousand dollars. People who are in twenty thousand dollars to sixty thousand dollars a year. That's what we're missing in the city, yeah. and even lower than that. And I think that um, that's the question: like, how do we build enough housing for the working poor, yeah. for the for the middle class? Well, to be clear, it's missing in the market rate housing, but there is subsidized housing that addresses that segment. Unfortunately, subsidies are limited. Yep, and I think we're seeing this emerging middle that is missing. So, uh, all right, let me sort of take this one at a time. First, there is a lot of market rate housing being built, but there's also a lot of subsidized housing being built. So for every Herald Square uh, that, that gets wrecked on the commons, we build one Breckenridge, right, that's right downtown. For every... City center, you've got Stone Quarry, Spencer and Stone Quarry. For every building in College Town, you've got a, you know, a 210 Hancock, which is a whole uh, um, development on the north side. That does satisfy the upper reaches of the income level, like, like you were saying, Seth. The 210 Hancock satisfies those folks who are coming from, you know, 20000 30000 maybe $40,000 in that range. But there's a whole host of people who are in the middle. You can't afford to live in city center, but you can't afford the subsidized uh, apartments at INHS. They're the folks who are getting squeezed the hardest right now. So I guess the question is, is it still okay to build market rate housing? It, yes, I think so. One, because when we build market rate housing, uh, we get a bunch of property tax revenue. Mm -hmm. And that property tax revenue helps us pay for paving the streets, keeping police uh, uh, on the road, and frankly, subsidizing other housing. Mm -hmm. um, I think, too, what it does is keeps folks who are, uh, as you said, well-heeled. I like that. It was a very polite uh, way of saying, like, like rich folks. You know, if they live in the suburbs, they don't participate in the economic life of the city in the same way. They don't shop downtown. They don't spend their money. They don't employ, uh, uh, you know, my sister who lives a block away, or they don't hire my daughter to babysit, you know, that kind of thing. So I think it's still good, but I do think we're at a point now where we have to adjust our housing strategy to tackle that missing middle. We have to adjust the incentives that we offer, the subsidies, Doc, that you were talking about, to reach those folks who are making $50,000 a year or $60,000 a year, and they've got two kids, they're looking for a three-bedroom, and it's impossible in the city. If you make $60,000 a year and you want a three-bedroom in the city... Um, well, forget about it. It's three thousand dollars a month, twenty eight hundred dollars a month. Nobody can do it. So we got to find a way to build more housing of that type while still doing uh, the third prong of our housing strategy, which is bringing down property taxes. Well, speaking of the word middle, yes, are we all familiar with the term the missing middle? Mm -hmm. It often refers to, as I understand it, infill or townhomes. It is the space between single family homes and high density apartment buildings. And it's often cited as, A, something that is not planned for in many urban communities, 
and B, a path to addressing housing for that middle population mm-hmm. that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And it's one of my priorities because I'd like to see our zoning be updated to allow a lot of it, especially townhomes. Mm. It's a way, in my opinion, to increase density of a neighborhood without dramatically affecting its character. Mm. What do you guys think about that? I, I mean, I'm, I would support changing zoning to encourage more infill development. Absolutely. I think that's... Uh, is definitely something I would support. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's, it's always, it's always a complication. You know, we saw with what happened in South Hill re- recently, right, right. um, that, that, you know, we talk about infill development in the abstract yeah. as a good thing. I mean, it's in our comprehensive plan. It says that we want more infill development. Um, we want more neighborhood, like you're saying, like neighborhood development. Um, but y- y- especially in a college town, that infill development can be student housing and right. student housing comes with a whole bunch of, of issues. So as we saw in South Hill, we got into the situation where we we're actually in a way like kind of contradicting our own principles right. and saying that we have to implement this overlay district. I should note that I was the sole vote against imposing you, that moratorium. That, we'll that's, edit that. We'll edit that out. That's true. <laughs> that is, that's fact. I mean, that's public record. Yeah, yeah you are. Well, he doesn't have to rub our noses in it though. We could uh, <laughs> we re- re- edit it out anyway. But it's, with any kind of housing, it's like the rubber really meets the road and how it, it manifests at the local level. And as, as you see, these things can sometimes – like you can say like, yeah, I support infill development. and mm-hmm. But you find that it, it gets more complicated when you – And to be clear, I, I absolutely sympathized with, with those residents. Would I enjoy parties next door? No, of course not. Part of my issue with that was that it was open-ended. There wasn't a timeline. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that it will be one of the areas that we focus on next – as we implement phase two of the comprehensive plan. But I also knew that it was going to pass Hmm. and I wanted to assert my support for infill and that there's, there's good infill. Mm -hmm. We can guide that. That wasn't part of the plan, uh, but I want it to be going forward. Yeah. There's good infill. There's bad infill. And then there's Gwen (laughs) Ifill. That was not, we can edit that out too. I, I mean, I agree too. I think it is time to do this. I've been a little bit shy about it, honestly, because of stuff what you described, this feeling that as controversial as the tall buildings on the commons are, yeah, and as controversial as student housing is, uh, what I actually find is that most neighborhoods uh, support building more housing on the other side of the city, right? Yep. It's like if it, it, mm-hmm. when, when, because they understand – that new student housing building is going to add a lot to the tax base, which can eventually lower their property taxes. They understand that that new building on the commons is going to support the restaurants, which will make it a little more interesting, a little more vibrant. Maybe uh, uh, more and more shows will come to the state theater. That makes life good. Uh, as long as I can go back to my neighborhood on South Hill and I don't have to like look at the building. Mm-hmm. They'll even maybe support the idea if you ask them, do you want, would one more family living on your block ruin the character of your block one more family and they'll say no not really and they'll say well what if they live right next door and they say now wait a minute <laughs> right? <laughs> right i mean there's there's levels of support and so a plan that would greatly uh increase the population of the city by allowing this infill has uh frankly come only after we've densified downtown and we've densified college town but i do i think it's time I, especially because there's ways to do this that will allow people, frankly, to not just get in on the action, but to see their property values increase and to see the quality of life increase. What am I talking about? I'm talking about uh, right now it's almost impossible to turn your garage into right. an apartment yeah. right? that you can then rent out to somebody. It's almost impossible to do that. It should be way easier. It's almost impossible to turn your upstairs into an apartment mm-hmm. and you live downstairs. If we made it easier to do that, um, if we made it easier to build tiny houses in the city, Right, these things that, uh, frankly, a lot of people look at it and say, "Well, I would never live there." Well, it's not for everybody, but it is for a lot of people. A lot of people are finding ways to live in uh, homes that are fifteen hundred square feet, and uh, and still live lives of purpose and satisfaction. In fact, we're finding a lot of folks of our generation. We're all the same generation, right? Close to it. Close, Close to enough. It. <laughs> you are the young in among us. Yeah. That's right. Um, in, in shipping containers, people are living in this. That's this right. Is, like retrofitted shipping containers. That, well, it came up because it was on the Ithaca Times had a poll 
because so the planning, <laughs> I saw that. the planning, I know. the planning de- department work plan yeah. had shipping containers mentioned in it, and so they did the times <laughs> in a poll. They said if the building, if the city building code allowed yeah. you to live in a shipping container, would you do it? And, and at last check, I looked at the poll. There's like sixty percent of the respondents have said yes. Yeah. yeah so there you go. Well, I'm glad they understood though the question, which is that like we're not just talking about like opening up a shipping container, like get inside. You know, those there are now. Uh, in D.C., there's fantastic examples of, and outside of D.C., examples of folks retrofitting shipping containers to be apartments that feel cozy and homey and are warm and safe. And it's neat. Again, would I live there? Well, probably, actually. But, I mean, would would a family of three live there? Not really. But if some of those students who are out-competing families start to live there, I think suddenly you're getting a uh, um, you're allowing for a lot more folks to participate in the life of the city. Yeah, I mean, I, I I appreciate that this isn't just about thinking about the bigger developers like the the Ithaca Neighborhood Housing Services, but also thinking about ways that we can change zoning and change regulations at the local level. Yes. And I think especially with our, our comprehensive plan, I mean, we're doing that. Right. This is part of the the planning department's work plan, looking at South Side, looking yeah. at South Hill, Waterfront, do, looking at neighborhoods and figuring out ways that we can change rules to to create more housing at the local right. level and watching what works. Like you know, you know, John Guttrich. If you look at what John Guttridge and uh, Urban Core LLC have done, these are the folks that took Press Bay Alley. Yeah. What was – now, again, if you ask somebody, would, do you want to open a business in the closed-down Press Bay of the Ithaca Journal building, they'd say, you, you're nuts. Nobody wants to do that. But when you see what he's built, what he's been able um, to put in place, not by making enormous changes, right? He added some lights. You had a courtyard. Suddenly, you've got a candy shop. You've got a coffee shop. You've got a bike shop. You've got – a circus school, right? Uh, th- th- examples like that, I think, Seth, is what you're talking about. I think it could yeah. work. I'm also really glad you brought up accessory apartments because mm. it's something I hear about a lot, it, not only as a way to increase our housing stock without affecting the character of neighborhoods, but as a way, as you mentioned, of making homes affordable for the mm. owner of that house. Mm-hmm. Another thing that comes up with small landlords is this idea of abatements for smaller landlords. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not an expert on state law. I feel like we would need some kind of state action to be allowed to do that. But I hear about it so frequently that I feel like it's something that we should talk about. Yeah, sure. Uh, so one idea recently that I've heard floated from Rich John, who's a county legislator, is the idea that smaller landlords could group together hmm. to get to form like a, a conglomerate so yeah. that they could get an abatement from the IDA. Cause you know, that's the problem with going to the IDA to get an abatement is that only the bigger developers can afford to do it. Cause it's an expensive process. There's a whole administrative cost to it and, and everything. Yeah. So this idea, I, I thought I found that intriguing because I've heard the same complaint mm-hmm. uh, because I think smaller landlords have looked at our city tax abatement policy and they're like, why aren't I getting the same kind of benefits that the larger developers in the city are? If they could, um, create these cooperatives Mm -hmm. and in return, I mean, we've talked about this idea of them, of of giving a longer abatement Mm -hmm. for affordable housing in turn, um, create workforce housing or affordable housing. That would be, that would solve a lot of problems. I feel like. Yeah. I like that too. I mean, so long as it, I like that too. What I often have to tell folks is that those abatements are incentives to get people to do things we want. Right. So, We give an abatement to a big developer because we want them to build 80 apartments. And if we don't give it to them, they'll, they'll go build 80 apartments in Cincinnati or in Lansing, Mm -hmm. you know, and they, they won't do it in the heart of downtown. So as long as those small landlords were doing something that we wanted, which was either adding housing units or making their units more affordable or retrofitting their homes with uh, solar panels or or heat pumps or something mm-hmm. like that. I think uh, I think it makes perfect sense. I like the vibe of this idea to to create co ops for landlords. It's like it's a very Ithaca idea, right? Co op grocery store, it's passe. Co op bookstore, who doesn't have one of those? Well, nobody's got a co op of landlords. <laughs> and and if it, if we can find a way to make the mechanics work, right? Right, like say they all go in together to get abatements and agree that they will cap their rents at a certain level. Right. Um, I think it could be a real winner. Yeah. 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 And I mean, this is kind of in the spirit of we've, we've been having conversations about um, our tax abatement policy and using 
the tax abatement policy as a, as a vehicle to get more affordable housing in the city, and even the county. Yep. We've been talking about it. Um, what do you think of that idea, Sante? I think it um, as a former member of the IDA. Yes, as a retired member of the retired IDA, member. Uh, I think it makes sense. I think we have to constantly be adjusting the tools that we use. Mm-hmm. A big part of my campaign, like when I first, I was on the city council in 07, 08, is we headed into 09. The scare, I mean, it was the crash, it was the scariest of our lifetimes, right? It was uh, um, catastrophic for a lot of individuals and a lot of businesses, but it was catastrophic for governments too. And we didn't see any new building projects happening. The truth is we hadn't for 50 years seen an increase in the population of the city, which is why the housing costs just kept going up and going up. And and notably, the the population of the county did increase in that time. Which is why the traffic goes up. So this is what drives me wild. The county's added 50,000 people over the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. When we build an 80-unit apartment building downtown, everybody goes... This is why the traffic sucks. It's like, no, the traffic sucks because there's 30,000 apartments and homes in the town of Ithaca and Lansing that didn't exist before, Mm -hmm. but all the employment opportunities still require you to crisscross the city. So no wonder if folks end up, by the way, 10 minutes in traffic, not the worst traffic problem, but it's all relative. So I understand that people get frustrated. I grew up in New Jersey and (laughs) it's not that big a deal to me. However, like many people who have migrated here, I've fully adjusted, and I if I can't walk or bike there, I f- it feels like an eternity. You get mad? <laughs> <laughs> it feels terrible. No, I know. And, and I do. I, I, listen, when I find myself in tra- like on Route 13, I get as mad as anybody, and I'm like, I'm going to write a letter. I'm yeah. like, how am I going to write a letter? Oh, yeah. letter. Uh, <laughs> but part of that, you know, how do you solve that when you've allowed this suburbanization to exist? Anyway, the, this was a long way of, of saying that um, part of the reason I ran for mayor and a big part of my platform back in 2011 was that we had to start building in the heart of downtown. We had to get something going to get our tax base going. We had to get even market rate housing back in the center of the city. We've done that successfully, but there's a whole population that's, that's being left out. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And we now, even if it was my own policy, even if I ran on it, even if it was important to me in 2011 and 2012, well, it's 2018 now. Yep. And we've got to adjust. Uh, and I think that means adjusting using whatever tools we have at our disposal. That includes our tax abatement policy. The only thing that gives me pause is that the tax abatement policy is actually not as generous as, mm-hmm. as it sounds. Right. You know, right. I mean, to subsidize, to truly subsidize forever a unit of housing, that is to say, to build a unit of housing and then make it permanently affordable for people who make 60% of that of our median income or less. Yeah. You're looking at $100,000 per unit. Right. Right. That's pretty costly. Sometimes more. Very yeah. costly. Yeah. I've looked at a lot of these these proposals. I sit on the program oversight committee right. for the Community Housing Development Fund. These affordable units average 300 to $350,000 per unit. This this 350 was around the cost of the Lakeview and the Amici House units and these are not to luxurious build. or to huge yes exactly yeah. to build and so i think people underestimate how expensive it is to construct in the city of ithaca and there's right. many reasons for it bad soils lack of competitive builders and just the fact that it's urban and tight um but whatever the reasons are it is extremely expensive to build in the city of ithaca that's right and and even if you were to so when you say tax abatement the way a tax abatement works is say i own a piece of property and i'm paying a thousand dollars a year on it right now and i want to build something that's way more valuable on the site uh well if i build it my taxes will go up immediately they'll go from one thousand dollars a year to ten thousand dollars a year i come to the county i want to strike a bargain i want to say well look i'll build it but i can't go all the way up to ten thousand right away let me go next year i'll go to two thousand the year after that to three right and after 10 years i'll be at ten thousand dollars so you're not actually giving away much money you're not even the the municipality is not giving away money, they are just cutting a bargain on the increase in the assessed right. value. It's like a public-private partnership. Right. right. Now, even if you were to abate all the taxes completely, right? If I were to say, I want to build all affordable housing on my site, uh, and you go to the county and they say, well, not only will you keep you at $1,000 a year, we'll drop you all the way down to $0 a year. 
and not just for 10 years, we'll do it forever. Even that would not be enough to find the kind of subsidy, Doc, that you were just talking about. Right. That would not be enough to build more affordable. You would still need direct cash and cash infusions from the city, the county, the state, or the federal government, and you would need uh, subsidized loans, right? So I, I think I'm open to, I think we should change our tax abatement policy to encourage affordable housing. But there's going to be a have to be a pretty generous subsidy in order to exactly one has got to be a generous subsidy two we shouldn't expect that to solve all of our problems right. we're going to have to continue to invest in it in other ways I mean it seems to me that you know the policy that we've had in place uh, is to been to lean on these nonprofit housing developers I mean especially INHS which yeah. is building like eighty percent of the afford- the That's quote right. unquote affordable housing in in the city right now right, right. I mean and so we we've, we've been leaning on these third party non private non profit housing pro- developers, you know the rescue mission. Lakeview is doing a project now in the West End, mm-hmm. and the challenge is how do, how do we grow beyond that? How do we compel the for profit developers yep. to include affordable housing in their projects? That's the real challenge that we've we've really been faced with. Yeah. And we've had a lot of conversations about this. And this, to this day, I don't think that we've come up with a good answer to that. And, and the reality is that we're, we're actually uh, – we're, we're failing in our housing policy. I mean pretty plainly. Like if you look at uh, – the, the county did that study back in 2006, right. I think it was, that showed that we had to add 4,000 units of housing mm-hmm. – uh, in, the, in a ten-year period, I think it was uh, throughout a, the county, yeah. and you know they recommended I think it was twenty five hundred mm-hmm. be affordable, right. and then affordable understood as eighty percent of area median income or, or lower. And I think we added like four hundred, so right. it's like ten percent. So it's like we're, right. it's like abysmal. We're not even coming close yeah. to the amount of affordable housing that we should be adding. Yeah. So the policy that we've been relying on, mm-hmm. of like use it, and I think INHS does terrific work. I yeah, think, great. I think they're awesome. You know, two ten Hancock is a fantastic. Great project but it, i noted it earlier in the interview that when you when you mentioned you know for every city center that goes up there's this affordable housing project they're all inhs like yeah. every single one that you mentioned they're yeah. all inhs so how do we get private developers for profit developers to include uh, a, even if it's just a percentage some mm-hmm. significant portion of the units in their projects mm-hmm. uh, to be affordable i think that's the question that we've really struggled with yeah I th- and I think it, the answer is complicated, unfortunately. I and mean, I should name drop TC Action and Lakeview and a, and a bunch of the other folks who who are de- beyond INHS. And the Reuse Center is coming up with a phenomenal Reuse project. Center, and we're seeing um, projects from uh, Conifer out Conifer. of Rochester. Yeah. Uh, so it is – the diversity is increasing, but your point is still taken. Yeah. Yes, and there are folks who do it professionally. Why? Because, as we as we mentioned earlier – it costs. It takes such a huge subsidy to keep housing affordable that um, most folks just don't know how to do it. They don't right. know how to go to the state chodo. You know, they okay. don't know how to go to. Yeah, I, I gotta say this: yeah. the low income housing tax credit. It's nuts. Can somebody explain this to me? Like I'm six years old. I like. No. I swear. To, like I. This thing has been explained to me like a dozen times, and I still yeah. don't understand how this works. There's like these corporations, and they purchase these tax credits, and then the tax credits. There's a competitive process, and developers are allocated the tax credits according right. to some. It's just so convoluted and complicated. Yeah. Well, and that's like that's how ninety percent of affordable housing in this country is built. It just seems right. so crazy to me. That is. And the reason it's built, it, the reason it's built that way, you you, you basically explained it. I mean, you explained it. Just I like still that. don't understand the what federal- I said. <laughs> I, I I just repeated words. I don't know what I'm actually like. What any of those words mean? Well, it's an incentive that was created, and the reason we keep talking about incentives is because um, we live in a capitalist society, and even a, a neoliberal capitalist society. So when we ask ourselves, how can we make for-profit developers build affordable housing. We come to the same conclusion that the federal government did. Uh, Well, we can't. Because in a neoliberal capitalist society, you can't make capital do anything, right? Capital does what it wants to do. And it goes where it will get the largest return on its investment. All you can do is incentivize capital, right? So we can't go to the private developers and say, you will, you must um, build on this site. And when you build on this site, 30% of the houses that you build will be affordable. 
Is that right or is that wrong? I mean, we could do that, right? Isn't that essentially what inclusionary zoning or zo- you could make a requirement where you say everybody has to build thirty percent affordable, and then but you could say they might not build. That's well, they, the right. problem. So that's what inclusionary zoning says. It says if you build on the site, you will include thirty percent affordable housing. You can't mandate you will build on the site, right? And I that's see a what you're saying, yeah, right? Yeah, and that's right, a big right. difference because what unless can you happen, own the site, and when we own the site, we do do that generally. Right, like we own the Green Street Garage, we're looking to redevelop right. it. In that, we have quite a lot of leverage because we can say we own it. So if you want it, this is this is what you'll have to do to get it. Same thing with the hotel, um, the Marriott that was built on the Commons. It wasn't built on city land, but it overhangs city land. And to get the air rights, God, this was a deal we struck back in two thousand eight when I was on the city council. Yeah. To get control of the air rights, they had to agree to pay 155% of the minimum wage, no matter what the minimum wage was. So the lowest paid employees over there at the Marriott make one and a half times the minimum wage, which is which is great. The low-income tax credits work the same way. The federal government was trying to figure out how can they force people to build housing that's more affordable. They found out they couldn't, so they're trying to wait, find a way to incentivize it. They created this product where big banks and wealthy corporations could uh, uh, get a deal on their taxes if they loaned money uh, to developers who would build housing for folks of, uh, uh, of moderate means. In this way, they were incentivizing people to invest. And it's the same convoluted sort of crazy thinking that we end up going through when we're like, how can we stretch the tax abatement program to end up with subsidized housing? It's very frustrating for folks. And, and a lot of these folks come to our meetings and they come to the IDA meetings and they say, why don't you just make, look, you got Jason Fain, just make him build affordable housing. He owns the site. Well, he can't. I mean, he can he can just leave it empty forever. And well, in Jason's case, it's what, he, what he's done with some of his properties. I mean- it does seem like a very convoluted way to finance affordable housing. Yeah, and, and the and the problem with it is that it's it's turned it into a, a specialization. Right. I mean, so you have these a small handful of of developers who specialize in it, mm-hmm. and then everybody else is just building on market rate. Yep. And then that's kind of what we see in Ithaca. Ithaca. Yep. And the same thing is happening all across the country. Yep. Um, if there was a way, I think for um, developers more broadly to be able to take advantage of those tax credits, I think it would be, mm-hmm. you'd see a lot more affordable housing being built. Yeah, man. I mean, the, sh- the most straightforward way to do this would be to have a pot of money that the government controlled that you applied for. You right. said, I'm going to build on this site and 30% of it's going to be affordable. Uh, government, will you subsidize it? Why can't the city do that? Why can't the city just create a pot of money to subsidize it? Well, in order to do that, we'd have to raise property taxes. Mm-hmm. Because property taxes is how we get most of our money. Oh, why is that a bad idea? Because property taxes hurt most the people who can least afford them, right? When you own a home and you bought it 50 years ago and you were a teacher then and you were retired now and you're on a fixed income, you live in Fall Creek. When you bought the house, it was $50,000. Now it's worth $300,000. The taxes are killing you. They're taking half of your income, right, from your pension and your Social Security, if we were to then raise those taxes even higher so that mm-hmm. we could subsidize affordable housing, we'd be seeing as many evictions and foreclosures, tax foreclosures, as we saw new houses being built. Why does the system work that way? Because it's a capitalist, neoliberal system that was designed to restrict governments and to give capital maximum flexibility. If, though, we had a more progressive system right, where localities could tax income, instead of property, right? Or tax, even have luxury taxes instead of just regular sales taxes, Mm -hmm. consumption taxes. If our federal government actually did its job and used its power to tax income progressively, then they could just distribute money directly to, because we all have people, I I know you have people in your wards that you knock on their doors and they grab you by the shoulders, they look you in the eye and they mean it. Serious is a heart attack. If the taxes go up next year, I have to move out. I mean, it's insane. I mean, I'm I'm paying almost seven thousand dollars a year on a twelve hundred square foot house, and probably was the last ungentrified part of the city. And it's yeah, crazy. Man. It's a, it's nuts. How how does that compare to your mortgage? Which is higher, your taxes or your? Uh, be close. It's probably pretty close. It's probably close. yeah. It's probably about half goes to the mortgage and half goes to the tax, which is wild. Now yeah. you knock on one of these million dollar houses in Cuga Heights, or we have million dollar houses here in the city. 
you knock on one of those houses, you ask them, How, uh, what's your biggest problem? They don't grab you by the shoulders and say, if you raise taxes, I'm going to move out. They go, oh, things are fine. There's potholes down there. You know, mm -hmm. I want more parks or whatever. You know, there are people who could afford to pay more to live in a city of high quality. I'm so glad you brought this up. So I totally agree with you that the federal income tax needs to be more progressive. But I would love one of the things I've been thinking about a lot, and I know it's it's a hard lift because we need to go to the state. I would love to see a local income tax. Mm. I feel like it would both raise revenue in a progressive way and to critics who might say, well, that would discourage people from moving into the city. It might discourage some of the wealthiest people to move into the city. And while I, I would love them to be here in the city, spending their money and living side by side with everybody else, it would mitigate gentrification i think um and since you brought but that also, up <clears throat> but i also don't i i don't agree with the premise that it would drive rich people away because i don't either i know why I, I know and, and there's this concept and i was at the governor's mansion last night in albany and he was talking about the fact that people move out of new york state because the taxes are too high did he have his dog with him he did he had champ with him <laughs> champ is adorable very cute Decided to throw that in there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was a very cute dog. It must be an election year. It was very, Seth is the, the parent of a, a very adorable dog himself. Yes. And yes. so now is our governor, yes. Andrew Cuomo, yes. has a very adorable dog. Yeah, champ, clear blue eyes, like a husky mix. Anyway, the, you know, he's talking about the fact people move out of New York State because the taxes are too high. Well, not truly, because the taxes are extremely high in Norway, but they don't move out of there. And guess who has a progressive income tax? In New York State, New York City, and Yonkers, and Yonkers, and right? Yonkers. So, in New, that's why on your tax form it says, "Do you so live in New York City?" New York City or Yonkers? But uh, the people who are fleeing New York State are not fleeing high tax New York City; they're fleeing the uh, cities and communities in upstate New York, like the one I grew up in, that were just decimated. They're flying places that don't have opportunity. In New York City, the taxes are high, but so, you know what, so what? The opportunities are high. The incomes are high because they built subways. There, there's access to things like the, the banks can access the theaters. The theaters can access the universities. They've all built an ecosystem relying on, in part, that progressive taxation and all the millionaires and billion, the, my Bernie, the millionaires and the billionaires haven't fled New York City mm. for someplace else. They still live there. So I, I think this fear, I mean, I, I think, I know that you were playing devil's advocate. I just wanted to play the devil's devil's advocate. I feel like it's a huge lift. And because Seth uh, works for an assemblywoman, I'm curious, what is your feeling on the legislature supporting a small municipality enacting its own income tax? I think it would be a big lift in the Senate. Uh, I think the assembly would be open to it, but it would be hard to get through the state Senate because it's the state Senate is in Republican control right now and yeah, they yeah. don't like new taxes. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a really intriguing idea. Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, I think politically it would be challenging, right? Yeah. In, in the current formation right. in Albany right now, it would right. be challenging, but that doesn't mean that things can't change and that, right. you know, there could be new leadership in a, in, in the future and you could see something different. Um, but I think it would be challenging in today's. And I can see it being challenging too for communities where the employee, the employer, the biggest employer seems more mobile. Yeah. You know, like Corning Incorporated. Right. If there's an income tax there, can you imagine Corning moving to Binghamton? Just be like, we'll, we'll keep our name, but we're going to change cities to someplace where they don't have an income tax. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, I don't know if it's Corning, but you name it. It could be IBM. It could be GE. <laughs> Um, does Cornell move away? Right, they can't. Yeah, I mean the clock tower is where the clock tower right. is. They, they could put a big crane to move that to Cortland, you know. Yeah. So, so I think it's easier for us politically to be like, we want an income tax. I do. See, I could see it running into some buzz saws in the Senate. I mean, I think it makes sense to give municipalities the power to enact their own their own rules and policies. I mean, I've always believed in that. I think, you know, I'm a big believer in, in home rule, but you know, with, with a change of that magnitude is definitely something that you would have to have approved in Albany. And, you know, we always talk about Albany. It's like, yeah. oh, this needs to get approved in Albany. And it's like, you're talking about like, you know, 
going to the moon. It or is something. true. It's like this impossible thing, you it know. Is. Like it has to get approved it in does. Albany. It stops so many conversations. <laughs> it stops so the conversation at all city so hall. It always it's true. It if, always stops the conversation. Yeah, like, it, oh, this needs to get approved in Albany. And they're like, oh, that's impossible. Well, go. Never mind. Let's go to our next <laughs> like, meeting like, now. Like, right. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Just so <laughs> listeners understand, even to enact a a new residential parking permit system, mm-hmm. we'd have to go through Albany, the state legislature. That is true. That's mind boggling. It's wild. It's true that we would have to go right. to the state legislature so like, to get to ex- expand right. our residential parking permits. So it's like <laughs> you live on Cascadillo Street and you're like, we want a permit here so that only people who live on Cascadillo Street could park here. You have to go to your state senator. And then people that never, convince, yeah. I have people that reach out to me, you know, live in the second ward and they're like, oh, I want to get that residential parking permit. And they think it's just, you know, it's a quick fix. Right. You know, they're going to see it happen in a, in a month. Change the signs. Yeah, change, change the, the signs. signs. Yeah. yeah. And then you, they find out, you're like, hey, you have to go talk to your state senator. And not just yours. You got to convince the <laughs> dude from Nassau County. Right. That's right. That, like, like Captain Dillis Street should have it. Yeah. So yeah. I've always been in favor of localities, gov- local governments, municipalities having that that authority and that and that power. So yeah, I would definitely support it. Here's another one. Um, I once said on the floor of council that I'm a tax and spend liberal. I don't <laughs> quite regret that statement because it's kind of true, but it, the, the optics aren't great. But there's another tax idea that mm-hmm. I think is really interesting, and that's the land value tax. This is before I was on council, but council upzoned large portions of the city. By upzoning, I mean they allowed greater density in downtown and college town which made the owners of the land, the existing land, millionaires overnight or dramatically increased the value of that land because larger structures could be built upon it. A land value tax would allow us to recoup some of that increase in value that we gifted Mm -hmm. to these landowners. What do you guys think of this idea? Again, I think if it's doable, and my my understanding is it's never been done in New York State, but it doesn't exist in New York State. All right. So how do you short? How do you create a short circuit? I like it too for the scenario you described. How do you create a short circuit for the retired school teacher who is sitting on a property that could that they bought for fifty thousand? The assessments creeped up to three hundred thousand, but when they sell it, it'll actually sell for six hundred thousand, right? And we know that. How do how do you stop the land value tax from hurting them? If there's a way to answer that question, well, the first scenario is an obvious, I think an obvious winner, because not only will we recoup more money, which we can use to pave the streets and lower everybody else's property taxes, but it'll actually encourage them to redevelop their underdeveloped properties, which is a good thing. But I don't know how to solve that first problem. We could have limits on profitability Right. In a sense, it's like a capital gains tax. Yeah. Uh, the difference is it doesn't include improvements on the property, structures on the property. It's the value of the land itself. It's also not something I understand completely either. Uh, you know, like Seth, I have tons to learn about this topic. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, but I like none, it. none of us are experts here. This is why we have a podcast. I, I that's I think that might be the title of the podcast. <laughs> none of us are experts here. <laughs> none of us that's, are experts. That's a good <laughs> far from it. That's a uh it's I like if if you can set expectations right from the beginning of the podcast. <laughs> none of us are experts here with Duxon and Seth. Can I just can I bring up another topic that I hear a lot from people? Mm-hmm. Rent control. Oh yeah. It was enacted in New York City. Mm-hmm. Um I don't know its current state other than I believe it's you know, it might be a grandfathered thing, but not something that's currently in, that's in effect right. for for new uh, rentals. And it's what? being phased out as folks pass away. So people who had rent control apartments, as they pass, the rent control passes. Having already established that we don't know anything, what are the <laughs> pros and cons of, of enacting a rent control system? So at the local level, if we were actually to mm-hmm. say that landlords can't raise rents mm-hmm. above a certain level... That's right. There's a few things. First, it's good for the people who are already in. If you're in, great. If you are not in, like the 15,000 people who commute, I'm not talking from the county into the city. I'm talking they commute from out of the county every day, 15,000 people. What happens when you have a rent control, rent cap, is people who have an apartment, even if it's not a great apartment, even if they begin to earn more money, as a lot of people do as they go from the 20s to the 30s, the 30s to the 40s, 40s, 50s, they do not give up that apartment. So they hold on to it, which means a whole, and this is what happened in New York City, everybody else gets blocked out of the market and out of the system. And the middle becomes huge, yawning 
gap. This is how New York City became a tale of two cities, truly, where the only people who lived there as of the early 2000s were the extraordinarily wealthy and those pretending to be Donald Trump and the extraordinarily poor, right? Because you had folks who had rent control. And there was a second factor that increased that big yawning gap between the rich and the poor, and that was uh, that landlords would have, so the way rent control would work is if you owned a whole building and some people had never moved out, right, and some people would deed their apartment to somebody else, so even if they had actually passed away, they deed their apartment to a nephew or an adopted daughter or whatever or a friend so that it could keep the cap, any apartments that actually did turn over, somebody moved out, you wouldn't increase the rent a little bit. You'd increase it like a thousand percent. So you'd go from you're on the Upper West Side and you were paying three hundred dollars a month for your apartment for forty years. Unbelievable stuff. Then when you pass your landlord goes, Great, I have one apartment in this whole building and I gotta actually make some money on it. That's the one I'm gonna charge six thousand dollars for. Right? So then an ultra rich person moves in. Ultra rich. Maybe they're from somewhere else in the city, maybe they're from Moscow, maybe they're from, from Asia, it doesn't matter. Six thousand dollars. Everybody else in the building is paying $300. Then two more apartments come free. Those will go for $8,000, right? So it creates a two-tiered system, which is why it doesn't work. Now, that's a whole big, long explanation to to say even if it did work economically, it's not legal. <laughs> but we can't do it anymore. Isn't I mean, isn't what Ethic and Neighborhood Housing Services is doing a form of rent control? I mean, isn't rent control just keeping rents at a level that might not necessarily match what the market NHS. determines? INHS does it in a different way, too, with its land bank, um, in that it kind of caps the growth of owner-occupied housing that they sell and manage. Mm-hmm. So they make owner-occupied housing available to buyers for way below market value under the restriction that when they go to sell, there's a cap on the amount of capital gains that they get. Uh, That's because INHS still owns the land under which that home sits on. And that retains affordability for the next owner. Mm -hmm. So I I think that is a great. great model. So I sent I sent you Duck this this uh, article earlier about Vienna has this really fascinating housing model in that Austria. It, yeah. In Austria, mm-hmm. yeah. So I just came across this on the internet. I was just mm-hmm. reading about it. I was like, this is incredible. So the city of Vienna owns twenty five percent of the housing stock huh. in the city. Twenty five percent is actually owned by the city. So huh. the city is the biggest landlord huh. in the city. Huh. Another twenty five percent is owned by these like limited for-profit developers. So kind of like Ithaca neighborhood housing services that Mm -hmm. the city partners with the city has this policy of they, they they aggressively buy up land Mm -hmm. and then they sell it back to these developers at an affordable price, a lower price with a lower interest rate. And then in exchange, they, the, the developers hold the rents at a level. And so essentially the city is kind of imposing that rent control. Makes perfect sense. I think it's, we've done that with INHS. We have done that with INHS. You know, I think that we could, we could be doing more of that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the things like, why aren't we looking at buying up more land to use for affordable housing? We've talked about it for our facilities, which we should, obviously we need to, to build a new police station and Mm -hmm. build a new fire station. But Looking at land around the city that could be available for affordable housing, like vacant lots or underutilized sites, and really trying to buy that land so that we could sell it back to a, a developer that will will build affordable housing. I mean, I I like it, and I like now that I, I now know three things about Vienna: the sausages, one, the the operas, two, and then now the housing program. I know it's amazing. Like uh, you run into the same problem which is that to buy the property and then to sell it at a loss is to use property tax dollars. Right. right? So it's like, where do we get this pot of money to do this with? It is available. I mean, we could do that. But that's even... We could do it. Even if we're we're talking about abatements. I mean, that's still property taxes, right? I mean, if if politically, if this community can support Mm -hmm. abatements for affordable housing, which I think it probably can, I mean, yes. I guess we're yet to debate this on Common Council. Right. We'll see how it goes. Right. I I think that you know where else are we going to get the money from? Right. It's it's just that the abatements are first tied to promises of increased revenue, 
Mm -hmm. So an abatement only actually functions if the revenue is increasing, right? So when you get a new building going and you have an abatement, you know that 10, you know that 10 years from now, you'll be bringing in more tax revenue than exactly. you 10 years ago. Yeah. That's the exact opposite is if you take a piece of private property that's currently paying taxes, mm -hmm. you take it off the tax rolls by buying it, and then you sell it to a private uh, developer who's going to do affordable housing, you know that you're guaranteeing lower... Lower property taxes. Right. right. Now, so that's a bit of the difference. The other difference is, again, the amount of subsidy it takes to do this is just huge, man. It's, it's huge. Just, it's a lot. I mean, this is where you get very frustrated. You sit in City Hall and you feel like you're chasing your tail because... The answers are so obvious if you were sitting in Congress right, or the state Senate. Right? If you were in one of those places, you could just raise your hand and say, oh, gosh, well, here's, here's what we do. We got a lot of people who are making uh, $500,000 a year. Right. They don't even know how to spend that money. Yeah. Not only do they not know how to spend that money, but their quality of life won't be greatly improved by buying another boat their quality of life will be improved if their neighbors can afford their rent. So the best thing we can do for them is to increase um, the taxes from 37% to 42%. And then we just fund these affordable housing, right? But otherwise we end up in this neoliberal trap where we're like, oh, we'll, we'll buy the property, then we'll build the affordable housing like, well, wait, where do we get the money? We only have one place we can get the money, and that's from for-profit development. But if we sold the property to a developer, mm -hmm. presumably we're selling it. We're probably not losing too much from what we, we bought it at, right? Yeah, one would hope. I mean, it's going to be less, right? Yeah. It's going to be less. We're not going to be part of the bonanza that's going on right now, right? <laughs> like in, but you, you wouldn't be, it wouldn't be too much of a loss. Right, but what you would be doing is secure is is ensuring that that property was affordable, right, for in perpetuity, right. Yeah. I mean, especially if you're selling it to somebody like like INHS, right. Yeah, and it depends too on what you look. If it's just like any real estate proposition, if we can buy land that currently has nothing on it, is vacant, and then we change zoning to ten stories, and we let somebody build affordable housing at ten stories, well, our purchase price. Is going to be far lower than we sell it at, even right. if it's subsidized and affordable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hard to pull that trick, though. Right. In part because any land that is vacant, that is already zoned for 10 stories, well, whoever owns it is already speculating on it. There's and still a lot of land in the city, though, that is... Definitely the West State Street corridor, man. Yeah. From, I mean, between Green Street and uh, Seneca, going from the Commons West to the waterfront, really. Yeah. Yeah, there's some opportunities there. Yeah. And I mean, I think we really have to get serious about this because, um, I mean, I think we're, we're losing the battle on, on housing affordability. Seth, the community you chair, Planning and Economic Development, is considering expansion of CITAP. What is CITAP? What does it stand for? And what would the expansion do? So, I mean, the first thing that I have to say is this is an awful acronym. Yeah. It's CITAP. Yeah. Which stands for, it's like C I I T A P. Two eyes. Two eyes. That's yeah. what always throws me. Yeah. And it's, I don't even know what it stands for. So it's Community Incentive Investment Tax Abatement Program. So it's right. the city's tax abatement policy. When we say the city's tax abatement policy, this is really a recommendation to the Industrial Development Agency, which is responsible for abating taxes for the city and for the county and for the school district. Right. And so if you understood that, you were probably on. The industrial development agency. Right. So how else do you <laughs> say, what is a tax seven, abatement? I mean, Savante explained it earlier. Yeah. Tax abatement is an abatement on the future taxes that, that accrue from the enhancement of a property, from a development right. of a property. Um, and, and actually, before you, sorry to interrupt, but before you go on to about the expansion, which I just asked you about, and I'm going to interrupt you. This is over, some context. I'm trying to provide like, context. Yeah, no, no, this is yeah. perfect. Another area of context that I've always been curious about is. A developer can go straight to the IDA. Mm -hmm. Is the CTEP simply an endorsement from the city, um, or does it carry some other weight that I'm unaware of? I mean, it, it is. I think it's a it's a political endorsement from the city, and I think that you know the the city decided that a long time ago, probably what like 15 years ago, maybe longer, that 
we wanted to incentivize downtown development in in the urbanized area of the city. And the reason was that nothing had been built. I mean, not, literally nothing since the 80s. I think the you mm-hmm. know, Center Ithaca was probably the last project. Nothing mm-hmm. was being built. And it was impossible to build anything. It's so expensive. So the city said to the the IDA, the Industrial Development Agency, we want to create this this program that will incentivize urban mixed use compact development. And the rationale behind it was that it was to rejuvenate the downtown core, to help the local businesses, to reduce sprawl. And I should say that at, at now everybody's railing against this thing. It's you know they're calling all the members of the IDA Republicans. At the time, 15 years ago, this seemed like a very progressive thing, right? Because what you're doing is you're providing the alternative to what you see on Route 13, mm-hmm. right? You're trying to build you know, development that's close to transit, that's close to jobs, that's close to houses, housing. You know, it's, it's better for the tax base, better for the environment. And how many projects were built under CTAP's predecessor, CIP, C-I-I-P? So if you go way back, and this, and this program has gone through a very complicated history where there have been versions of it. It's been amended and modified a bunch of times. But if you go very back to the beginning, um, a lot of projects that I think that we recognize now as kind of iconic, like you know, uh, the Island Health and Fitness mm-hmm. was built under it. Um, Hilton Garden. Hilton Garden was built under it. The both gateways, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mia was built under it. Mm-hmm. I th- I'm pretty sure Mia was. So that was the so there's the first iteration. That's what you were talking about, where they built Hilton Garden and the gateways, and then SIP, which is what Duxon was talking about. Oh, okay. Nothing was. See, built. I don't even know what the hell. It was kind of a leading nothing question. Was, <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing was built. Yes, nothing was built under SIP, and so for like seven years or so. And so it was it was tested, and so when people do complain, and they have every right to be skeptical because I understand when you're giving up tax revenue from what these developers who have seemingly plenty of revenue, it looks bad. But we have actual evidence that before it was amended, this program failed in its mission to actually create density downtown. But what the what the critics will say is that when it was amended was also right around the time of the recession, so nothing was being built. Um, so if you look at the history of this this program, it was very liberal back in the early two thousands, and then it was amended to include all these requirements. Right, because it's like if you're giving a tax abatement, then we have that gonna we have to have a community benefit. Right. And as soon as you start asking about community benefits, well, then everybody this is Ithaca, so everybody has to have their community benefit. There you talk a, about affordable housing and living was, wage. There's a checklist of 27 things, and you had to have 19 of the 27. 27. It was like this complicated approved. checklist, yeah. and there's like bike racks right. and you know livability, living wage, and sustainable. Everything was in there, right. and you had if you went Solar down, you got a certain number of, of points, then you mm-hmm. could get the abatement. That was the amended version, and then it went back to being simplified. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was right when the recession ended. And under the the simplified version that we have now, which is that you have to build up at least three stories, you have to increase the value of the property by five hundred thousand uh, dollars. What else is? And in you there? have to be downtown. You have to be downtown. You have to be in the density district. And there's some other requirements in there too. Some some other ones about like that brings us to labor. another point where it's, it's it's endorsement from the city, but the endorsement comes with these requirements. Uh, one that we added when I joined council was this local labor reporting requirement Mm -hmm. where we're going to try to see how much local labor is actually used on these projects uh, because people have been clamoring for a requirement, but we didn't have enough information. And so uh, the compromise was to just collect that data in the interim. And maybe we're already meeting the targets that many of these advocates are asking for. Yeah. We, we, we now have this local labor reporting requirement, which is good data to have. I mean, it's good information to have. Uh, but under this this newer version, more simplified version mm-hmm. of the program, uh, there's been a number of projects that have been built uh, on uh, the Marriott, uh, Tompkins Trust, Herald Square City Center is it's being built right now um, that have gotten tax payments. But what we're seeing, and I think at the time, you know, when we amended this thing back in what, like 2012, yeah. I think our it was a very different time. I mean, we it, the city was in a recession. Mm-hmm. I mean, the nation was in a recession. Mm-hmm. We had a $3 million budget gap mm-hmm. in the city budget. Mm-hmm. Nothing had been built for a long time downtown. You know, amending this program was a way to spur this development. What we're seeing now is that the projects that are being built, right. a lot of them are these higher-end 
housing projects, as apartments for, again, to go back to the professional, Mm -hmm. well healed, Mm -hmm. you know, it's their retired Cornell professors and Mm -hmm. lawyers and professionals and what have you. I just love that well healed. It sounds like people with either with nice shoes or people who were once sick (laughs) and have been much improved. They're like well healed. Anyway, sorry. I I like that expression. It's good. But what we're not seeing is we're not building enough housing for the we talked about before the missing middle, the working class, the, the middle class, and and I think that's where we now have to change the program, mm-hmm. change the whole program. Yeah, um, I think it has to stop. This is my personal preference. I think it has to stop being a downtown revitalization tool and it has to start becoming a affordable housing tool. So when you ask the question, this is a long way to answer your question about expanding the boundary because this is coming up now. And the reason it's coming up is because we have developers that want to build on the waterfront because our waterfront is, is direly in need of improvement. I mean, this, we have the crappiest waterfront <laughs> in upstate New York. I'm not ashamed to say it. it's, it's like a bumper. How's that for a bumper sticker? It's terrible. It's yeah. off. I mean, the, it's, there's some really nice great. additions. To, we have the waterfront trail, which yeah. is beautiful. Mm-hmm. We've got the, the farmer's market, the farmer's market, which is amazing, but we've also got the DOT facility. We've got the DPW facility. Marabado. I mean, we've got a wastewater treatment plant. I mean, mm-hmm. I realize that's not going anywhere, anywhere, but it is a wastewater treatment plant, and it is on our waterfront. Oh, that's what you meant. You said the crappiest waterfront. <laughs> <laughs> you are absolutely right. It's crazy. When I go to Watkins Glen or Canandaigua, they're, they have beautiful waterfront. I mean, you go to Seneca Falls. They have this beautiful waterfront. And it's, I mean, literally, there's... I, I mean, the, the, the assembly speaker came up because mm-hmm. I work for Barbara Lifton. The assembly speaker came up a couple of years ago and he, oh, you know, yeah. was inviting him to go to up. dinner. And he was like, where can I get dinner on the waterfront? Thank God for the boatyard grill because yeah. if it wasn't for the boatyard grill, there wouldn't be anywhere. I mean, yeah. it's amazing that we have this waterfront and there is no place to get dinner other than the boatyard grill. You remember how mad he was about Jeff Stein the whole dinner? He was mad about Jeff Stein. Yeah, That's right. That. That was funny. Jeff Stein, founder of the Ithaca Voice, now at the Washington Post, getting stories on A1. I'm very proud of him. <laughs> We're all very proud of Jeff Stein. Yeah. It's a shout out to Jeff Stein. But, but back then, he was needling our speaker. And, uh, <laughs> and he was, boy, he was he was not going to let it go. Carl he was, was, he was upset. It. I don't even remember what it was about. What, on a future episode, I we're going to have to cover... The way the governor yelled at Yusuf. Uh, that will that will be a topic of, of a future <laughs> <laughs> in the cast episode. But to go back to the waterfront, so now, so because we have this terrible waterfront, and we have a lot of, we have some developers in town who are very interested in developing it. The challenge for developing it is that it's insanely expensive. Now we've always we've talked already about how expensive it is to develop in Ithaca. The waterfront is a particular challenge. Because you got these these soils that are super loose, really challenges all kinds of constraints. The pile and, driving necessary to develop on the waterfront uh, when you go above, say, three or four stories, can add two, three, even more millions of dollars to the project cost. Exactly. And so now we have these developers coming to us and asking us to expand the boundary for our tax abatement district mm-hmm. because they need the tax abatement to actually do anything, to, mm-hmm. to build anything. They actually need a tax abatement. If we, if we don't expand this district, they will not build. Mm-hmm. But th- what we're realizing, as I said before, is that we're not building enough workforce housing, and affordable housing in, in the city. So now the big debate for common council is becoming if we're expanding the district well if you're building on the waterfront or you're building anywhere you should be providing affordable housing Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that is where we find ourselves and that's what we'll be debating on the common council in the next few months Mm -hmm. i think it's great i think it's a great conversation to have because we've been talking about inclusionary or incentive zoning uh for a while now white plains and new paltz both have i believe incentive zoning programs and it makes sense i think for us to Consider joining their ranks. Yeah, me too. You know, I am nervous about inclusionary zoning, right? I'm I'm a wholeheartedly enthusiastic about incentive. So if incentive zoning is this, if you want to build something, yeah, say the zone says you can build it to 30 feet tall, we'll let you to build it to 40 feet tall if it's affordable, right? So you get the developer to... Uh, make something affordable by increasing the amount of profit they can make on that site. That's incentive zoning. Inclusionary zoning mandates that if they're going to build something, they have to include affordable housing. 
Inclusionary zoning, what worries me is that we'll pass it and we'll feel great about passing it and we'll get good headlines and I'll do a whole bunch of interviews about how progressive we are and we care about the little person. And then for the next 10 years, nobody will build anything at all and the city will become even more unaffordable because it's too restrictive. It's early so, yet, but that's kind of what we're seeing in Portland, Oregon, which passed an inclusionary, a mandatory inclusionary zoning law and uh, development has dropped off precipitously. Significantly. So, but the crisis is large enough that I'm open to it. I mean, you know, I want to make sure that we do it smartly so that we don't run into that scenario, but I'm open to it. I'm enthusiastic about in, in incentive zoning. I'm open to inclusionary zoning. But if if you require it through the tax abatement policy, if you requ- yeah, if you put a that's requirement, because that's inherently- wouldn't that almost be achieving the same thing though? Yeah, it's an incentive. Sure. Yeah. What kind of stuff is is the planning committee contemplating with regard to ex- both expanding the abatement area and the requirements that you might put on recipients of of that benefit? We're, well, I'm not really sure yet because it hasn't come to the planning committee, but it will be there in March. March is going to be a really challenging meeting because we have a bunch of things with the parks master plan and the green building policy and chain works plan unit development the nines is coming up for designation oh, yeah. it's going to be a challenging meeting but one of the things we'll be discussing is this que- is exact question um, if we're expanding this district and allowing these uh, developers on the waterfront to get a tax abatement um, what will they be providing in terms of affordable housing and that's that's a question i think we should be asking not just at the waterfront I think it's a question we should be asking citywide. Mm-hmm. If you're getting a tax abatement, you should be providing housing for people that that want to live in Ithaca um, so that they're not forced to, to move outside of the city. This might be a good time to do a segue about how you can get involved in these decisions. One is to email us at council at cityofithaca.org. That goes to every member of Common Council and the mayor. Mm-hmm. And so it's a really easy way to get our ear. And yes, we all actually read every email. Even when we're slow to respond, it's only because we are inundated with email. But we all I know for a fact that we all read all those emails. We do. I find the most important emails are the ones that I'm slowest to respond to <laughs> because you look at them and you think, this deserves like right. a, my my best response and yes. my most thought. So I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> pin it and I'll come back to it later. Oh, then, pinning it I like love. five weeks later. <laughs> oh, you're like, God. what was this one about? You voted on it anyway. Uh, the planning meetings are the second Wednesday of every month, and that's you know you you can attend the meeting, you can read the agenda at cityofithaca.org, and then email us about your comments. Uh, you can watch us at Ithaca ny.vibit.com V-I-E-B-I-T I'm so com. impressed that you know that. Yeah, that's incredible. incredible. That's how you can watch us streaming. We're also on channel 13, I believe, on cable. What's my Twitter handle? I believe it's Savante Myrick. Okay, that's an easy one. What's Seth's Twitter handle? <laughs> His is easy too, Seth Murtaugh. Oh, God, mine we got to think of a harder one. <laughs> mine is not so easy. What's mine it? is Duck Second Ward. So D-U-C 2-N-D Ward. That's pretty good. It's not too bad. I'm just trying to think about what what's WRFI's call check. I I'm so impressed that you know <laughs> all of these ways to participate. What's, well, it's uh, it's really important to me. Yeah, I, I, this is why we're doing this podcast. Why we're sitting yeah. in my living room yes. on a Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Yes, uh, is because we care about engaging our citizenry. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right, that was a crazy segue. Talk about crazy segues. Remember segues? <laughs> <There's> a, <laughs> they were supposed to reform. All of urban America. There's a thing now. Have you heard about Bird? No. There's a thing. I just saw it. I was in California. I was visiting my sister. It's a scooter. It's like a motorized scooter, like a razor scooter. So you stand on it and you you zip around. Um, And you get where you're going. So they stack them by like bus stops. They stack them. They just stand there and they're locked automatically. You, on your phone, you unlock it, and then boom, you, you zip, say, to a restaurant. And then you just leave it there on the sidewalk. Wow. You just yeah. walk away from it. And at the end of the night, wherever it ends up, you can take it home, right? You zip home. You leave it outside your door. Wherever it ends up, they send out their team. They collect them all, and then they put them again outside these big transit hubs. The idea being that it's going to solve that last mile problem that the folks have uh, i saw it on the street for the first time they're being sued all over people in santa monica are like i don't want to see these ugly scooters sitting on the sidewalk in front of my brain. but anyway uh that was a segue about segways that's perfect let's talk about the future 
you're skeptical about focusing on parking mm-hmm. when we are a decade or a couple decades away from a world with autonomous vehicles. Sooner. Oh, no. Sooner. Not this. No, we got to talk about God. this. Oh, God. No. This could Sooner. change. No. Happening. This could change no. urban life. I, as I, just, know I, have to, I have to point something out, which is I made a bet you with Samante. You change these timelines. No, it was, in, it, wrong. it was in 2013. Yes. I made a bet that you said there would be driverless cars. Every, 80% of the cars on the road would I'd be driverless 80%. cars. This is 2013. In five years. Years. That's right. I said that they would Five be as, years. I would say that it's they would be as commonplace as hybrid vehicles. In 2018. Here no, we are in 2018. First of all, first I don't see any driverless cars on the road. It was 2015. <laughs> so he's always saying this. Every time he brings up this bet, he's like, he's like, 22 years ago, you promised me. It was two, it was the summer of 2015. We're sitting on my porch on East Seneca. And we're talking. And, and yes, I believed then that we were five years away from driverless cars being even 2015 bro you're losing this bet like what are you just gonna admit i I, I will admit that i lost it the day that it's over in 2020 in the summer of 2020 if we don't see as many self-driving cars uh as we did priuses in 2015 then i'll pay you that 10 bucks but until then, I'm holding out hope because I think it is coming soon. I mean, did you see that guy who who used Cadillac, the, the Cadillac that's on the road now? It wasn't a concept car, but he used the Cadillac now and drove hands-free across the country. You did know, not see that. That's, I, that's interesting. I, I, I think it will happen. Yeah. I think the timeline's a lot farther up. So Ka- did you see Kathy Hochul? I sent you that email about Kathy Hochul. Yeah. Who was well made known a protection. She said it 120 well known, years. Well Alon, 120 years. Elon which, Musk and Lieutenant <laughs> Governor Kathy Hochul. The which two, makes more sense to me. That makes more sense. Come on, Doc. You're an engineer of sorts. I Tell him say, the challenges that are involved with building driverless cars. For those who don't know, I'm a software engineer. Um, that's my day job. And... It is enormously difficult to do anything. To display a tab on your browser is filled with crazy bugs. I do believe that the day of autonomous vehicles will come and they will be safer than human drivers who are prone to all kinds of horrible uh, errors. Uh, But I am increasingly pessimistic about the timeline. I don't know know how to predict it. That 10 bucks is mine. (laughs) First of all, you sold me 10 bucks. You thought Cuomo was going to be indicted. Better. Oh well. Hey, that's happen. another. This, that's per, that's per, another, another podcast. Whole other podcast. This, this Prococo trial is, is is happening like right now. Talk about segways. You can't touch. <laughs> I think so. Yes, I think self driving cars is coming. I think when it comes, it will change cities forever for the better. But we have to be prepared for it. I think it could ruin cities if. We allow continued suburbanization, right? Self-driving cars will make living in the suburbs much easier because you can just, you could wake up at four in the morning, get into your car, fall asleep, and have it drive you four hours in the city, right? It doesn't matter how much traffic there is. Um, That would increase our emissions. It would increase congestion. It would increase social detachment, all the bad things that come from suburbanization and car culture now. But if we prepare for it, what it could mean is that all of the land that we dedicate to parking now, on-street parking, off-street parking, garages, all of that land could be turned into playgrounds, housing, gardens, parks, agriculture, right? We could live in actual garden cities like the French planners of the 1800s imagined. Um, but it won't happen on accident. And it won't happen if we just wait until self-driving cars are everywhere and then say, oh, maybe we should address our zoning or maybe we should, you know, have not spent that $40 million two years ago on a parking garage. So uh, I believe it's coming and I, and, I, and I believe we should harness it. What's going on with LEED? Oh, yeah. Uh, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. It's a program that will give officers the authority to instead of arresting people for low-level offenses, to deliver them directly into a treatment plan, right? Uh, we have been trying to initiate this. To make this happen, it requires great coordination between your human service agencies, the police, the Tompkins County Sheriff's, and the DA. Uh, we now have everybody on board, but we got to press go. So we have a meeting scheduled for late February with this broad and 
hairy coalition and this messy coalition um, that's going to oversee the program. And I'm hopeful this will this will start in the first quarter. So how much? So I, I'm trying to remember. We approved fifty thousand fifty thousand dollars. So that that's what we've approved at this point to pay for it. That's right. Is the county chipping in anything? We hope so. We're asking. We'll see. So it has to be like a match, like kind of on the model of the the community outreach worker, exactly. Which is a, has exactly. been a successful position. It could even be through the same agency, Family and Children Services. It could be. It doesn't have to be, but that's one of those th- things that that committee, once it's up and running, will will start. Just we'll a decide. random aside, not, not random, but a related aside. Um, recently, we learned that on my block, I live on Cascadilla Street, and around the corner from me in a former medical office at Court and Cayuga Streets will be an opioid treatment facility. They're called Reach, and they are looking to add enough doctors such that they can treat on the order of 150 mm-hmm. new patients, which I am very excited about. Mm-hmm. People often ask me, about nimbyism and say, well, when it's in your backyard, how will you feel? I got to say, I am excited to have this option for people uh, who are addicted to opioids to have access downtown. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that, man. I think it's not everybody feels the way you do. Absolutely. And I think in part, cause not everybody, I mean, you and Amber have big hearts and open minds and that, that, People like you are what make Ithaca the place that it is. You know, a lot of folks, a lot of mayors, I had a lot of mayors when the Ithaca plan came out, called me and be like, this is great. I love it. I can never do it. How did you do it? Uh, how how can I, if I'm in X city or Y city, how do I get away with it? And I was like, uh, just be in Ithaca. That's the, key, that's the plan, to get, the key to getting away with it. And I think what Justine, Dr. Justine Waldman is doing with Reach, this, um, it, it's going to be incredible. And and I don't think it'll negatively impact your neighborhood or any neighborhood that it's placed in, in part because uh, by their very presence, the people who go there are seeking help. They're not seeking to uh, shoot up in the alleys or or uh, uh, to break into folks' cars. I mean, they're coming there because they are trying to um, detox and get clean. And we have this huge backlog of people who are trying to get clean. I think, too, there's this misconception that the only way to detox or the only way uh, to maintain is methadone. And there've been, and in methadone, of course, you have to come back every day, right? So the idea of a methadone clinic where you got all these people waiting outside in line and it changes the character of a neighborhood, that's not the way it works anymore. There's medications that they can prescribe that you take yourself. Uh, you only come back once a month to get a prescription refilled. So I, I, I think it's going to be a big improvement for our city. Are you at all jealous mm. uh, having raised the profile of supervised injection facilities nationally that Philadelphia or San Francisco might beat Ithaca oh. to a supervised injection facility? Oh God, no. I'm a, I'm not jealous. I'm embarrassed. It's not just embarrassed. Folks in Ithaca have heard about this, right? Because it gathered way more attention than I ever thought, than we ever thought it would. It's an idea that's been proven to save lives for decades. It's been saving people's lives, increasing the chance that they go into treatment, decreasing crime and nuisance problems, decreasing HIV and decreasing decreasing hepatitis. And it's been doing it in Australia and Switzerland and countries all over the world and Canada. I am embarrassed and heartbroken that we haven't done it here. And whatever date, the most progressive cities start doing it. Whatever that date is, say it's August 1st, 2018 in Ithaca, or it's July 1st, 2018 in Philadelphia, or May 1st Super Bowl in champions San Francisco, the Philadelphia. <laughs> the Philadelphia Eagles. Or May 1st in San Francisco. By the time the least progressive communities start doing it, Earlville, where I grew up, Uh, years will have passed and tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people will have died unnecessarily. This is the story that's happened with sex education. This is the story that's happened with syringe exchanges, right? 
counties in Indiana when Mike Pence was governor and said, oh, syringe exchanges are bad for you, so we're going to shut down all the syringe exchanges. The HIV rate went through the roof. Hepatitis rate went through the roof. They had to reverse course and reopen the syringe exchange, but it was too late, right? The damage was already done. Uh, uh, that's how I feel. So, I'm, and I'm glad. I'm glad that, uh, frankly, somebody else goes first. <laughs> I have enough, you know, shitty emails about uh, uh, wanting to open heroin dens. And I, I mean, other people who, frankly, the very fact that they take the time to write means that in some sense they care, but frankly don't know enough about the the public health reasons for an injection site. When I read comments about how uh, offering Narcan is enabling usage, I get really pissed off. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really disturbed and uh, enraged by these sentiments that don't value human life yeah. for something that affects a huge swath of America. Yeah, I mean, it's maddening. Maddening. In part because of its... And forgive me for being like not PC. Uh, it's willful stupidity right for for somebody to say oh if you give narcan to somebody to save their life they'll never learn their lesson as if you have to allow them to die to learn their lesson you know how stupid that is? i mean it's mm -hmm. not just callous mm -hmm. it's illogical you can't learn anything once you, i mean the first path to recovery is staying alive so um i i'm with you i'm with you and and it certainly, there was no impetus to do this except that I thought it was the right thing to do. So, And beyond that, so one of the first things that I got to experience when I joined council was um, Seth had organized this meeting between uh, residents of Breckenridge and uh, Ithaca Police Department. Mm -hmm. One of their complaints was drug use in DeWitt Park. Right. And mm -hmm. so there's, if you have no moral compunction about users and what happens to them, there's a pragmatic side to addressing this, and and that is if you don't want to find needles in the parks that you hang out in, a supervised injection facility or other harm reduction techniques will mitigate that, will we'll concentrate the usage in a place where those people can get help uh, and, and out of the public bathrooms and parks uh, that you don't want your children running into needles with. Yeah, man. Where does this stand with the state? I know I saw I saw a political article recently where um, I think it was Zucker, was it Howard Zucker, was was mentioning you. I, really? I think so. Oh, it really? said that the mayor of Ithaca proposed this like a year year or yeah. two ago, and this is something that we're looking at. Yeah. Um, is it? I mean, is this something that the state could realistically that we could see? Yeah, I think it gives it gives me great hope that the governor's office has never come out against it, even when there was intense pressure. Uh, when it, it sounded like a shocking idea, we hadn't yet done a lot of public education about it. People didn't understand the purpose of it. Even then, the governor's office was quiet, silent. And uh, so where we are right now, there's a bill in the House, in the Assembly, and in the it's Senate. Rosenthal. Rosenthal. Yeah. Under Rosenthal, downstate. Cat who's declined. The, who's the chair? That's, that's, that's her big thing. Is the cat that's decline, that's one of her big, yes. Yeah. But she's also the chair of the Alcohol and Drug uh, Committee in the Assembly. And uh, she, she's she got a bill going. I don't think it'll pass because, like so many public health crises, you know, the legislature runs behind, way behind the science and well behind public opinion. Right, it's like with marijuana legalization. If it was in track with the science, it never should have been made illegal in the first place. If it were in track with public opinion, it would have been legalized ten years ago. But legislatures, um, by dint of who makes them up, are always running behind the science in the legislature. Mm -hmm. What that means, though, is that an an, ex an executive of vision and an executive. Um, that trust science can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Governor Mario Cuomo, uh, when the legislature was not going to make syringe exchanges legal in New York State, even though uh, huge numbers of people were dying from the HIV and AIDS epidemic, he in the Department of Health signed an executive order declaring it a state of emergency and authorizing communities to open their own syringe exchanges. And that is how our own syringe exchange staff and many others in the state still operate today is through that executive order. There is a chance. And what we are petitioning for is for the Department of Health and the governor's office to approve. 
um, communities that want to do this to do this. So on that note, we have to ask Savante. Yes. Are you running for president no. <laughs> of America in 2020? Which America? Are you running the for United, president of the United States the United in 2020? <laughs> no, I won't be old enough in 2020. And uh, oh my god, I'm always reminded that you're way younger than than, than, than I'm we not are. Way younger. Are you running for president of Switzerland? <laughs> <laughs> I met the president of Switzerland. She came here actually to yeah. talk about their drug plan. And uh, no, I'm not running for president. I um, have happened upon the best job in the country. I mean, the best job in the country is to be the mayor of a city. The best city in the country is Ithaca, New York. So I've kind of maxed out my happiness and satisfaction. So my hope is to stay here as long as people will have me. Um, we're in the, we're watching this congressional race right now. I'm watching it with great interest to see who to support and with great sympathy and empathy for the people who are running and how difficult it is. And not one ounce of uh, jealousy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every day of this race, I watch and think, I, I am so happy and feel so lucky to be working at the local level. I'm with you, man. Being on city council is exactly where I want to be politically. It's great, man. In that I connect citizens with services. Mm -hmm. I affect things like zoning that most people don't want to deal with, but that affect their lives immensely. Mm -hmm. And that's what I enjoy as a policy wonk as a nerdy engineer type the cities are where the the innovation in our country will occur yeah it's a good yeah stuff. it's a very cool position yeah very cool even as much as i would like some of those levers to be able to like do progressive taxation the for every one of those issues there's 10 more where i'm like oh, i'm so glad we get to set sidewalk policy Right. Hey, you right. know what? You're not just the mayor of the city of Ithaca, but you are a constituent of both me and Seth. That's, That's right. True. What are the huge complaints that you oh, have boy. about our representation Thank and the so second much. word? Welcome to the segment of the podcast that we call, you know what grinds my gears. <laughs> right. You, you, you get to complain to us. Absolutely. Because oh, we are your representatives. So many, That's I have right. so many concerns. I've got one yeah. that... Yeah. You should complain about. Okay. But. Tell me what to complain about, and then I'll complain back to you. Because you live in my neighborhood. That's right. What the hell is up with the South Albany Street Bridge, man? Bridge that, that sidewalk, sidewalk is being killing closed. me. I know. It's killing and me. <laughs> my God. If How that is was, it clear? You just crossed one block earlier than you would have No, it is. It drives me crazy. I like, I, Especially when it's cold. <laughs> yeah. And I get, I like, I'm approaching it, and I'm like, oh, my God. <sighs> I got to like walk just yeah. a little bit longer. So, I swear to God, if that was a vehicle lane, yeah. I'm getting, I'm prepared yeah. to write Mike and Ray and all the other folks at DP. Yeah. I don't want to do it because it's such like a, I don't want to be like that nag, no. that common council nag, get it but I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting ready to do get it, it because if that was a vehicle lane, yeah. that would have been open a long time ago, but it's like, you're interfering with my commute to work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is my commute. I feel you. But how much are you actually interfering? You I'm not to, really in it. It's not that anyway, much of a bit. Because you cross anyway, that. right? Seth, come on. This this is okay, the mayor's sorry. opportunity. Right, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was just giving, I was throwing you one of mine. I got a lot of I got a lot of beefs with you people. What's it? What's it? I feel like it's Festivus. <laughs> he goes, oh, I got a lot of I got a lot of problems with you people, and you're all going to hear about. It. No, I. Uh, uh, it's a funny thing because you run for office. I ran for office anyway because I read the paper and you go to meetings and you think. I, if I were there, I would do this. If I were there, I would do that. And uh, I still feel that way sometimes, right? I still feel that way sometimes. I walk past a pothole and I think, um, this this literally happened to me in, I was in Baltimore. And I walked past this one block and I'm like, the sidewalk is crazy. I'm going to do something. And I was like, oh shit, this is not my problem. I forget this is not my problem. Um, but the truth is, I'm not grumpy. I'm quite happy. I, I really like this place. I love living here. I love uh, I love my neighbors. I love that I can walk to work. It's a 10-minute walk to work. And that I'm not the only one. Sometimes I see Seth walking to work. Sometimes um, I see the folks at McGraw House sitting outside. And like I talk to them, and they yell at me about what they're mad about. It's and, a crosswalk. 
The crosswalk? They weren't the crosswalk. We're going to get that crosswalk. Yeah. (laughs) Hey, we got the bus stop. We got the bench. The bench. You got the bench. You got the bench and the bus stop. Crosswalk. And then they want two thirds is a failing grade, man. I'm just saying. They want a shelter. So this is like, we've gotten two out of the four things in the plan. (laughs) It's going to be a long multi year effort. See, but this is, I like that. I'm uh, I'm happy. I think, and I think you two are doing a good job. I I have often. Um, I used to be on the city council, and I wish I could say that I was as good at it as the two of you are. I mean, you're always lifting up the voice of your constituents. You're always um, getting from city staff what your constituents need. You're always reminding me of what your constituents need. You're doing it respectfully, but you do it forcefully you know like you you're not um pushovers uh but you're not disruptive or distractive forces you like lead your committee and you lead on your issues in uh in ways that mean a lot to the people who, who live in your neighborhood so i'm happy second warder for now um but glad to hear it but if you plow over my sidewalk one more time i'm gonna no no, no i'm a happy second warder we're not here just to, to grill you, but um, you are part of the People for the American Way's Young Elected Officials Network. Yes. Um, if there's, is there anything you want to plug about that while you're here with us? Well, sure. I, I mean, what we do, and this has been an excellent exercise for me over the last year. Um, many of the kids may have noticed that, like, I'm not around at the like at the farmers market as often as I once was, or or uh, at events, particularly on weekends, as often as I used to be, because I'm, I take off uh, a lot of Fridays now to go and either raise money or help train young people to run for office. Because uh, I believe if this next generation of leadership isn't first informed by how government works and how it can work, then they'll never take the reins. And I think, too, that this generation has a lot that they can offer government in terms of their energy and their creativity and their moral authority. And so that's what I do now. If people want to learn more about it, they can check out the Young Elected Officials Network, the Frontline Leaders Academy, or YP4, Young People 4. Great. Well, Mayor Savante Myrick, mm. thank you so much for helping us launch our podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the beers. Thank you for the company. It was really nice. This podcast was brought to you by the free time of your elected officials. <laughs> <laughs>